This is Blair Henry here for Broadcast Journalism, and today I'm talking with Luisa Hoyos, a documentary filmmaker and photographer for National Geographic. So how did you first get started in photography? Like, what piqued your interest in that? Well, I don't know. As a, as a kid, I've always been interested in, in art, but art takes a long time. And uh, I, I guess I had a, a relative, a cousin, who was a, a professional photographer, and he gave my brother a camera, and uh, that was basically it. I was probably about nine years old, and just fell in love with, you know, you could take art instantly. I think when you, you put, you know, when you take photographs, and it's the right photograph, and it's the right story, you can literally change not just the, what a person is thinking or what they think of the truth is, but you can actually change the way that behave when you have something really powerful, an idea that is so transformative that um, they behave differently, they act differently. And that's, that's become the goal with uh, photography and film with me. It's really, uh, how do you use this really powerful weapon, photography and film, to change culture? And what made you, what led you to make this switch to film from photography? Um, I think it was, it's easier to express myself with, with uh, deeper ideas. When we made our first film, The Cove, there's so many ideas around that, but it, it became the, you know, if not the, uh, one of the most winning documentaries in history, but one of the most winning. It's, you know, the first film, first documentary to ever sweep all the, all the film guilds. And I told a friend, boy, I wish I would have got started in film sooner. And he said, well, you probably would have been a shitty filmmaker. I think it's, it took, you know, I was about 50 years old when I uh, transformed from being a, a photographer to a filmmaker. When I was working for National Geographic, uh, I did a story on the information revolution. This is about 1992, I think it was. I started that, that and this is just right, right when the internet began. And the guy that developed the first commercial internet browser was, was this guy by the name of Jim Clark. And I wanted to film him for this National Geographic story, which then I think was like called the Information Superhighway, something like that. But he was too busy to be f filmed. He was a, uh, Jim was a serial entrepreneur. He, take th he took three companies from scratch, meaning there had been no business there before, and invented a business, uh, an industry, and then met, made them all worth over a billion dollars. So I was working for Geographic. He was too busy to be filmed. Then at Fortune magazine, when I started working there, I was photographing covers. They wanted me to photograph Jim. And I was really excited. And um, he was building a boat back then. It had the world's tallest mast. It's called Hyperion. And I went, flew over to Amsterdam to meet him. And he was starting a, a fourth company called Shutterfly. It was how to, you know, taking digital photographs and making them in analog. And he said, Louis, would you teach me how to be a good photographer? And I said, Jim, I'll teach you how to be a great one if you teach me how to be a billionaire. <laughs> and, I mean, quite literally, he would pick me up on his golf stream and we would fly around the world and I'd, we'd be taking pictures and we mostly did underwater and jim um uh, we you know we, we were we were taking underwater photographs and he said i want to take you to the best place in the world to you know that I, that I'd ever been diving he'd been diving about 15 years longer than me at that point and we went to papua new guinea we flew to papua new guinea his boat met us there we sailed for about like a day and a half and he dove on the on the coordinates, the GPS coordinates of this reef. And he came back up and he was like in tears. It was like this, you know, the reef is gone. You know, we don't know what happened if it was bleaching or been blown up uh, by dynamite fishing, but it was gone. And every time we went back to spots, you know, the third time we were in the Galapagos, we came up from a dive and we were surrounded by fishing boats illegally fishing in a marine sanctuary. And he said to me, somebody should do something about this. And I said, how about you and I? He said, what do you mean? I said, we'll use your money and my eye and we'll make films. And that's what we did. And when you were making The Cove, you used some unconventional and somewhat extreme methods to capture the footage. And was there ever a point where you thought that you were going too far or putting yourself in danger? And if you were putting yourself in danger, did you think that it was worth it for the message that you were trying to convey? Yeah, we... <laughs> We were in danger. I mean, we were in danger of not just getting arrested, but, you know, maybe getting killed because all the fishermen, the dolphin hunters in Japan, they all, you know, they drink in the morning before they go out. They all carry these long knives. They're all pissed off. They would, we'd be hiding in the woods around the cove 
and we would see them going through the woods in flashlights and we'd be hiding in there. And, you know, you never know if you're going to get caught or what's going to happen. So, yeah, we were scared every day for our lives. But, yeah, it was a worth it. I think every day we thought, well, let's, we got to get this. And the film's been out about 12 years and dolphin hunting is down more than 20. Uh, sorry, it was down more than 93 percent since we started. So it's had a, a, an enormous effect. And I always thought, yeah, it's like it's a big sacrifice because you're spending all your time and, and energy to try to do something bigger than yourself. And so you make work. Um, with the intention of like enacting change and new policy and in the cove you don't hold back at all in your depiction of dolphin hunting in japan so do you think there's some value in shocking an audience rather than pleasing them yes i think there's a i mean my way is i'm trying to do all that in in a documentary listen i never set out to make a horror film I didn't set out to shock people. I hated horror films when I was growing up. I mean, I literally, like, I still don't like to watch horror films. But when I, when I realized that we made one, I went back and I watched the films I didn't want to see as a kid. You know, all the Hitchcock films. I looked at every one of them. And a lot of the films that he did, like Rebecca, you never see. It's all, all the horror is done with, like, music and, you know, the tension is with the lighting. And I thought, okay, we can, we can use some of those same techniques when we do the code. If you look at the code, you never see a, a harpoon go directly into a dolphin. This, I'm not going to say it's, it's not, you know, a difficult scene to watch. I mean, it is a difficult scene to watch, but it's a lot of the horror is just in your head. There's a, there's a scene that we did in that film where we put an underwater camera in the cove, and that was one, like, the best scene in a movie that year. That was, there's a, they give out, you know, um, accolades for that. And the, 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 the scene is just this. We put a, a camera in about six feet of water. The dolphins, when they, well, I'll, I'll say that all, all you, you see in that film, in that in that piece of footage, is uh, there's some stinging catfish that come by, a little school of stinging catfish. You hear the boats coming, you hear the dolphins screaming, and the water goes from green to red. You haven't seen a person, you haven't seen a dolphin. You haven't seen any death. All the horror is in your head. You've imagined, like like Hitchcock, you harness the ability of your audience to imagine a horror that might be far worse than what you could show. Or if you show it, it would just turn turn them away. You know, we can't inundate people with tragedy and horror. We got to figure out a new way to communicate with people. Right. And I think we did it with that film. The film is a, you know. Rolling Stone gave it probably the, the nicest review I saw. It said the, it's a, the Cove is like a cross between Born Identity and Flipper. <laughs> I, did. I would agree with that. It definitely is. And so in both the Cove and Racing Extinction, you kind of move away from the traditional verite style of filmmaking into what's almost an infiltration. So what kind of led you to cross this line? Um, watching too many Jacques Cousteau movies and James Bond movies, probably as a kid, I think would probably be it. You know, I, I wanted to make films that I'd want to see or my kids would want to see. You know, people remember and they, they're impacted by stories. So telling a story is important. You know, it's not just a documentary. It's just, it just isn't like shoveling a bunch of ideas together to prove your point. You know, you're, you don't want to make doc. I don't want to make documentaries that makes me feel right i want to make a a documentary that's that's effective so is that kind of what you hope to achieve from your films is just breaking the the common mindset to enact change yeah yeah it's a uh you know that's the goal how do you how do you find a lever what's the lever you're gonna need to press to impact change you know there's um (laughs) And I'll just give you an idea. There's a lot of, you know, when you get to be as old as me, you, you get to see a lot of movements. I had one of the first electric cars in Colorado. There's only three electric cars that I knew of back. And I had a 2002 fully electric Toyota RAV. And it was powered by 114 solar panels on our roof. And I wasn't paying for, for gasoline. I wasn't. In fact, I was, my electric bill was about $1,000 a month. And between work and home. And I went from having an electric bill to getting an electric check 
because I, I got paid for excess consumption anywhere between 200 and 600 dollars a month for produce over producing electricity and that's like why this is why don't people adopt electric cars and now and, and in racing extinction there's a scene in there where we take a a, a model s a tesla model s and we put we turn it into a bond car and it's the first car in the world to have an electroluminescent paint job um we have a forward-looking infrared camera a clear camera that comes out of the front where the, the engine usually is on a traditional internal combustion engine car we have a 20,000 lumen projector that comes out of the back with a, on a robotic arm. And I was interviewing Elon Musk in 2012. It was 10 years ago last month. And uh, he said, well, can, he, he wrote, said, can we change the, the interview till the next quarter? And I said, yeah, why? He said, well, I could go bankrupt. And in that film, we interviewed him for the film. He says, it doesn't matter if we go bankrupt. Well, the, the goal is just to inspire people to change. So if other car companies to change. And, you know, he made a a, a better, cheaper to, to run car than any, you know, other on the planet. And he was going to go bankrupt, he said. Now you look 10 years later, he's the richest guy in the world. And he inspired everybody else to to change and these technological changes take about at least 10 years so just to end it off um do you have any advice for anyone who would want to follow in your footsteps well yeah don't follow my footsteps follow your own steps do, do what do what think about what what is going to get you up in the morning what's going to get you excited about what you do and follow your passion i mean it's, it's kind of trite everyone says that but it's the truth and mm -hmm. it takes a while till you figure I mean, you think what what is what, what bothers me about the world what do i want to show people what excites me and if you follow that and and i would say kind of ignore i mean here, here's here's some advice don't take advice from people like me <laughs> when i when i first when i first was doing uh the cove um uh okay i'm all excited i'm try changing careers mid-career and i'm on this new boat that jim clark had built a 300 foot boat called athena world's largest private sail boat different than what i was talking about my kids starts we're down on vacation in the caribbean together with my family on his boat and my kid starts playing on the beach with another kid it happens to be steven spielberg's child he comes over to the boat to meet jim because he did jurassic park on jim's computers and i get when i get spielberg alone i, I hadn't made the cove at this point i hadn't done anything i just you know i just had you know enough money to you know to to get started in this new business and i said mr spielberg do you have any advice for a first-time filmmaker he goes yeah never make a movie involving boats or animals <laughs> so um i would say you know when somebody's trying to back a like a business you know a vc a venture capitalist they don't look at the business is it going to be a viable business as much as they do what's the quality of the person do they have what it takes to get through all those low points because there's going to be a lot of ups and downs if you want to make money from a film that i do you're better off taking your money to vegas because you're the odds are better of you getting a return the ra racing extinction was the uh the most expensive film to be paid for a film for the previous five years coming out of Sundance when we sold it, but it still made 37 cents on the dollar. But, you know, it created laws that, that film helped create laws that protect some of the most endangered species on the planet. You mm. know, we, five and a half, 5.4 billion people saw the projection events from, I should say, uh, uh, 5.4 billion media views from the projection events that we, we did with that film. We, you know, a lot of people that started the Extinction Rebellion were inspired by that film. Right. You know, but I said, you know, if you want to change the world, though, you know, you come to the right place. Mm -hmm. And I'm I think I'm just about out of time. But okay. thank you so much for speaking with me today. You're a huge inspiration. And this really means a lot. Oh, well, you're welcome. You're <laughs> yeah. Welcome, yeah, thank you. You're welcome, Blair. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>